just need to figure out how we leverage the resources we have and optimize it in a way that does not hurt the investor, but that also uh, ensures we're building a sustainable ecosystem. Coordinated initiatives, uh, master plans with specific goals and objectives, back to planning Ghana, um, put together in 2009, 50% broadband penetration, reduced broadband costs by 80%, reduced CPE costs uh, by 90%. Um, very focused and targeted, obviously there's a whole white paper, there are owners, different agencies that have been set up and we operate in Ghana uh, and I see the progress, um, you know, month after month um, in how the industry is being developed, how new licenses are being issued to ensure that they're building a viable ICT ecosystem. A lot of the uh, universities in Ghana, they are actually progressing with their research and education network and a lot of the re um, universities in Ghana are being connected, we're providing uh, bandwidth to the National Information Telecomita, it's called Telecommunications Agency, and then they're building that up. They bring community centers and they're also connecting secondary schools as well. Um, what else about the countries done? Providing access by stimulating demand, educational institutions in particular. Um, that's just a pet um, issue for me. Uh, one, it drives demand. Two, it enhances the quality of education. Uh, three, create skill sets to go out and create jobs, empowerment, to get information, um, and, and really just feeds feed on itself if you get this into school. I, and I realized, obviously, during my career in the United States was when the internet grew as well. And through similar programs to what we have, universal service provision, a lot of subsidization being given, uh, is how those school networks initially developed. And, and today, you take it for granted that any academic institution in the United States will have wide access all the time. Uh, focus on development of local content and ecosystems. These are some of the economies that really focus on how can we leverage these technologies for our industry uh, and different strategies in different markets, but all of these clearly have taken an activist role to pushing ICT. Some of it you can't do business with government. There's certain things you cannot get without using ICT. But then it's not just the carrot, but you also have to give the stick um, and you have to give support and it's a set of coordinated policies. Uh, incentives for investment or tax breaks in the US when internet shopping first came online, you bought on the internet, you do not pay tax. Sales tax in most states is 6 to 10 percent, so it's an immediate incentive for you to buy over the internet. Um, if you go to underserved areas, you get um, an increased subsidy. If you invest in certain kinds of businesses, um, you don't pay tax. I mean, I mean, we've done some of this um, in Nigeria, as we recall, the DSM <coughs> had a five-year tax holiday when they came in, as well as exclusivity. But we seem to have forgotten some of the things that even us here have put into play. And of course, pioneer licenses. So the US is, we have all these big companies. If we don't did spectrum auctions, they will get all the frequency spectrum to deliver services. So we're gonna reserve some spectrum. And companies that come up with new innovative services, we're gonna allow them to get that spectrum. So I don't know if some of you are aware of companies like Clearwire in the United States and the US that's deploying new 4G services that's not coming out of one of the incumbents. They're able to leverage those that kind of spectrum without paying the billions of dollars that the big guys play, pay and get access to roll out services across the country and build new businesses. So it continues to feed the development of the ecosystem with innovation. Is it achievable in Nigeria? Um, yes it is. Um, but unfortunately, it's going to be a slow process and it's just a reflection of some of these challenges and the overall state of development of our economic uh, system. And you know, obviously, that's humbling for us as well because with the capacity we have, we want everyone to have it and we want it to be fully utilized. But the reality is some of these challenges and the lack of the structural support to move the industry forward in tangible ways. Um, is, is really not facilitating the growth. Uh, obviously, further interventions, and we hope with some of the programs being advocated under the SHORE program um, and with the new uh, Ministry of Communications Technology, um, will drive that, supporting private sector investments. Private sector is what works. Um, we know government doesn't work. Even if someone is committed to do it today, when that person leaves in four or five years, you know it's not sustainable. So I don't want to turn tax money, not my tax money, spent that way. Um, you know, current limitations are a reflection of our development challenges. 
And while some of the building blocks are there, there is a lot more work, I think, that collectively, as stakeholders, we have to do um, to get to available everywhere, um, affordable, and always on internet. Thank you very much. Well over 4 million Nigerians on Facebook today. 
our president has a lot of fans, now, whether they are still fans of you or not. You don't get that good as mine. You know, I looked at this figure last year, or middle of last year, it was about five months more, and they seem to be you know, very nice fans. And then by now, it's about almost 700,000, but the nature of the correspondence of the Facebook page has changed quite drastically. However, he does have more fans than a lot of the other presidents, probably more than in Canada, more than in Zuma. And I think it buttresses your point about uh, our culture as people who engage a lot, okay, as Nigerians, part of our culture. A lot of activity going on on social media now, a phenomenal amount, and I think we even saw it with the, with the strikes and how a lot of information was being transmitted very rapidly across social media. The challenge is to start to leverage some of this interaction and collaboration more for economic development. So socially, we engage it. Okay, so that's all that's happening. But let's look at this on the global scale. You know, because we always have to put everything in perspective. Where we are on the global scale, what can we learn from others on the global scale? And I'm going to be picking on two ratings that were done, um, I think we'll find more recent videos in the 2010 ratings for Economic Intelligence Unit, Digital Economic Ratings, and the UN EWCLA. Just very briefly, as of the last Economic Intelligence Unit, Digital Economic Rankings, Nigeria was 61%. That's why it's so very why is that important of this year? Okay? Yes, finds all of these developments. 61 of the 70. The usual suspects are, of course, at the top of the ladder. Um, Scandinavian countries, the US, and so on. The digital economy rankings, we formerly call the UNS rankings, was one of the media world. And it's an annual benchmark of a country's digital development. And essentially, it tries to determine how well we are able to utilize SDG growth years. Okay, these are some of the indices that it uses to categorize uh, irrelevance of the digital economy. It looks at the connectivity and technology mm -hmm. infrastructure. Clearly, the highest weight. And I think that begins to explain where we find ourselves at the bottom of the scale. Business environment, social and cultural environment legal environment, public policy and vision, important as well, and then consumer business and business adoption. Okay. So, of course, all of these are broken down into much more discrete elements, which we don't have time to touch on today. The UN e government survey, you know, has looked at it by regions and by countries. No surprise that Africa is lagging behind most other countries. But if we look at this in a little bit more detail, we see Nigeria. Surprisingly, in the period between 2008 and 2010, we actually lost ground. According to this study, we went from 136, about 181 to 150. We lost ground in terms of government uh, adoption of the ICT in my government. Now what I found interesting about this particular survey was that it wasn't the usual suspects that were at the top of the ladder. We have people like Korea here, we have people like uh, Singapore, you know, we have quite a few interesting countries, Estonia, who seem to be faring quite well. And in Africa, the top one countries, Tunisia, Mauritius, um, Egypt, South Africa, and so on. Nigeria is not there. Um, Top and developed countries, Nigeria is nowhere here. <laughs> so, what are the key findings from that survey? That the digital divide is narrowing, that that trend is expected to continue, that we now find that we have innovative digital practices and applications being commonplace on the internet. For example, mobile data tools and ICT for building capacity in communication. In summary, these rankings show that there are many ways to harness the power of the internet to improve economic prospects and like economic and social impact. Okay, so the e-inclusion challenge there is one that a lot of countries are facing. And of course, I 
things like India and Malaysia have actually been able to do quite innovative things to try and address that challenge. You know, in India, they've come up with an e inclusion program so that they can even reach the illiterate, illiterate people. And in Malaysia, they also have a similar program to be able to reach people who may not be literate, may not be young and minority, but are still, they still need to be part of the economy. So, internet illiteracy then, what is it that is so attractive, so interesting about it for us in Nigeria today? A number of things. Well, clearly it's a change catalyst. You know, it's, 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 I think it was really interesting. The picture that Funker painted for us when she talked about what could happen if the internet was really good to us in this country. You know, the impact on education, the impact on entertainment, the impact on everything that we do is phenomenal. So we begin to see that it has a capacity for change, it improves efficiency, convenience, increased velocity of money because there's instant multiplication. You can do things immediately. It promotes innovation, collaboration, it boosts transparency, it boosts it enables business relationship, um, localization, cashless, and that's the buzzword we have in Nigeria today. Reduce time to market, partnership to the customer, global sales channel. Reduces cost, always open for business, enables customization, provides wider choices, accountability, and of course, the inclusion. If that is the case, then, that in itself enables lots and lots of opportunities, uh, services, entertainment, functional, secure e initiatives. Some of these initiatives are already operational in Nigeria today. In fact, many of them. It's just that the skill and the functionality and the security still leaves a lot to be designed because of the infrastructural challenges. I mean, look at the opportunities for building infrastructure, some of which we here have touched on, but also for building content. You know, look at all the other opportunities that could be unleashed if we had an effective internet. Infrastructure. Okay. The inhibitors, she took a different view, and it's slightly different, but I think they are the most important. There are many. Okay. She touched a, a bit on the last mile infrastructure, but we know about car, we know about illiteracy, about security, and then we touch on this a little bit more. The legal and regulatory framework is still not there, and that is a huge challenge for anything that you want to do in this country. The deficit of cyber companies. Um, some of you may not really remember what those things were. You know, there was a time we had a whole proliferation of internet companies, and then they cut down on them because of, you know, of the, of the activities of um, form like that. But was it a good idea to have internet cafes? Surely it was. You know, and it would be nice to be able to have a lot more of those things so that it's more accessible. Stakeholder e readiness. You know, that is the whole, the whole stakeholder group. I, I, I started with a challenge to say even if internet access is automatically fast and reliable, what will you do with it? What will I do with it? Are we ready? Trust, major issue. Awareness, complexity, unique identification. We're still grappling with an identity card project. The social cultural environment, the skill base, and availability for material and reliable data. These are some of the the enablers that currently exist. Now, I believe we have two functional submarine cables that are first. Um, main one, I know one, and I understand that there's another one that's about to launch. There is also a proliferation of smartphones. We have a new ministry now, the Ministry of Communications and Technology, which does indicate that perhaps government is waking up to the fact that IT should be strategic, ICT should be strategic in this economy. A high cost of cash, I think from a CDM point of view is a no-brainer, you know, that we should promote electronic transactions because cash is just too expensive and too risky. If it, the internet does provide a low-cost channel and the fact that bit by bit, under the radar, we have started to accept e-instruments. What do I mean by that? I mean, I go to a website a lot and nine times out of ten, people have you know, the e-ticket. Most people do their tickets online in um, Nigeria, especially local And so those things are beginning to be accepted. 
and therefore it promotes you know, more and more the use of those kinds of things. The threats are many. I will start with touch on it very briefly, the information security threats. I'm sure we've all heard by now about <coughs> the Najaf cyber hacks. A notorious group that are determined to use the internet to express themselves, express their dissatisfaction, meaning the government. And so they've been hacking a lot of sites recently. I think the charity for them was last week's great attack on the CGN site. They actually did break down that site for a number of hours. And they, they hacked a lot of other sites. Okay, this, is a diff this brings a different space. On internet activity in Nigeria. Because before this, hacking had always been under the radar. Now it's not under the radar. It's big, it's old, it's hacking. Okay? So we have to also understand that with a lot of the de desirable effects and desirable impact of increased value, there would also be the negative effects. Again, my question is have we met it? You know, I've put up some here, I've put up mainly the government sites, but I don't know many private sector there are private organizations that have had their sites hacked over the last few years. It happens every day. You know, apart from the embarrassment, because may, most of what they do is graffiti. You know, they just deface your site and show that they've done this. Apart from the embarrassment, there is also a very high possibility that there's also been um, an actual um, financial breach for the transactional sites. Okay? And of course, there is social engineering, which is still very commonplace in Nigeria today. You know, I like this quote by Kevin Mitchell. He says that my access to Motorola, Nokia, ATT, and T son depended on the willingness of people to bypass policies and procedures that were in place years before I could find them successfully. Okay, so he's saying that this is, I mean, this guy was a well, well renowned hacker who has now become an ethical hacker. And he basically said that his successful hacking exploits wasn't because he was that smart, or because he was that intelligent, or because he had the most sophisticated tools, or because of his ability to engage in social engineering. You know, get the information from people. And social engineering in this environment is incredibly easy. You know, I mean, I'm so friends, I mean, I go into organizations all the time. Apart from, you know, the phishing attacks over the internet, more than one interaction. A phenomenal amount of information that you get. And as an attacker, what you do first of all is survey and get information, and then use that information to mount it. So we've got to watch out for these kind of things in our organizations. And then, of course, with the Web 2.0 and all of the social computing, um, there are also other threats. You know, so a lot of people are now using using social media on a corporate level is great, but you have to be aware of the challenges that you face also, the loss of control, compromised quality. I don't know, sometimes, I don't know how many of you have looked at a blog or have looked at some trade, and all of a sudden the whole discussion just goes, just goes crazy, just goes, gets sidetracked, because somebody sort of just uh, manipulates the conversation. Stupidity, the group thing happens, stupidity of powers untrustworthy information and rules, time wasting, the fact that the largest was in the point, and so on and so forth. And then there are privacy threats also in this web 2.0 age. It's incredible how much information people put up on their Facebook page. I know. Because you can actually <coughs> put out somebody excellently well on their Facebook page. And you know, it's Abroad and even in Nigeria now, people are beginning to try and put people's face to face to try and chop people up. Because when you come for an interview, you put up the interview face. And then you go to your Facebook page and try to get a feel of who you really are in this creature. Okay? <laughs> Apart from that, you have to be careful. Apart from that, you've got to be careful about what you are, the information that you are letting out about yourself. There's no problem. There are people who let that Okay, so there are those threats also. The fact that you know, Big Brother is watching all the time and nothing is ever private anymore. Um, alongside our national, our national culture, privacy and information security, which is very 
more network you have, uh, if I, you know, you can't go to the primary route, you can go to the secondary, so uh, you can get there. So, so we're, we're working on, on all those funds. Um, in terms of rollout schedule for West Africa, uh, I cannot give you a date, obviously, because not too many of the variables are outside our control. Um, and also, to be honest, really depends on the structure of those local markets. If, if here in Nigeria, where there was so much demand, there's so much population, it is our home country, and we know this market really well, um, in terms of moving out of the capacity we have, uh, we're challenged. Now think of other markets, I mean, pick the two largest English-speaking markets in West Africa. Um, now think of the Rappaport market, with different industry structures, different operators, uh, and our ability to actually penetrate those markets and build cables to there. So it really depends on the right partnerships, it depends on the regulatory structure, it depends on the demand for the services and their company. So we're continuing to look at it with um, more focus on partners and going into those countries. Uh, we are, however, building into Togo, we built into Togo, and through Togo we get access because there is a whole country network. So we do get access to that network and we're able to serve some of those countries. We also work with Vodafone in Ghana and through them we can get access to other landings on the SAP cable system. So we are able to extend our reach, uh, but we're doing it on a case by case basis. Yeah. So, uh, we had a chance to ask what this time. Okay, um, I didn't leave my journal earlier, but I'm trying to run it from the train line. Um, my question is to this is for okay. What is the what is the one I want to know what the one table is doing in the area of collaboration with our university to set up the site centers of material shares in the high security institutions. Because in your presentation you raised a number of issues and you can see that in developed countries that happens a lot because in the Nigeria environment we really lack that that's of the primary sector being able to collaborate with the to actually show how the um, environment should move forward. Because if you're looking at you know you have deployed your pharmaceutical cables now, we need to be able to deploy technologies like dense wave multiplexing technology. How would this happen? How will the university be able to do it today? And then, what is the possibility of manufacturing or uh, you know, production of some of the components of the pharmaceutical we are developing? Because all these things tied down to what we are talking about, you have to do what you are you have to do this. Is there no possibility of us being able to remove manufacture some of the components so that so we should not be looking at those in terms of um, 2 3 years after? I think we take like 25 to 50 years as a program management to develop Nigeria. Because now we say to be in the we have to develop a lot of capacity. So I want to know what you are thinking in that. Because if it's what uh, Mrs. Okuba has raised, it's just information security. She's been a lot in Lagos. A lot of people are doing data in Lagos. You always want to be in Lagos in terms of information security. But what about people in Lagos? 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 And all of our government that we need information security as part of managing our website and managing the IT infrastructure. So it's not something that the organization can do a loan from Lagos standpoint without a certain collaboration. I've been able to do some of these things. So I'll be glad to know in terms of collaboration and then manufacturing of some of the components, which I believe you will be very useful in their environment. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. With respect to universities and in field of particular interest, we have provided some capacity, uh, even as a startup company, the University of Nigeria and Sipa, we're also working with some other institutions um, and making um, and with available to them. We've also engaged with um, authorities. We're delivering on a commercial basis. We're delivering services at some of our universities today. Um, we, we've also engaged though with the authorities and the bodies that do this so that we can do it in a programmatic way, or that the government has a programmatic way of, of really addressing institutions. They are also somebody, the, the Association of African <coughs> Universities is managed out of Ghana. You know, I, I think uh, what I would say is, in fact, uh, and there, there's several bodies, there's the West African, WAPRIN they call it, um, research, uh, West African Community Research and Education Network body, um, and then within that you have country bodies, and I think, uh, for example, the Nigerian one has had difficulty uh, getting up the ground, and just too many interests 
Uh, the World Bank is advising certain parties who've had meetings with them. The NUC, uh, it's just not clear uh, how kind of we can organize ourselves and move forward. So what we've been doing is more on a case-by-case -case basis, working with the universities. And we continue to engage those parties. It looks like there's a new initiative starting again with the NUC and the Minister and the World Bank to try to connect some Nigerian universities this year. And so the uh, web prepared, ready, and able to support and tend to do it at a very attractive basis because we believe it is something that is beneficial for the system. We think manufacturing is an objective as well, but to be honest, we're, we're so far uh, behind the curve. I think it's an evolution. Uh, what I see first is even utilization, uh, but smart utilization within a framework. Then we need servicing. Um, even a lot of the um, technology providers who are active in the Nigerian market today are not locating their service hubs in Africa or even in West Africa in Nigeria. You need to get into the service business. Um, once we start servicing, then you do integration and then you can evolve to reverse engineering and manufacturing. Um, but you know the scale of you know manufacturing of ICT really follows the market or low cost or skill development, some of the critical ingredients we do not have, or power. Um, so until we really have those things, security is really key, because uh, obviously uh, there's a lot of intellectual property involved, and whoever owns those rights wants to be sure that they are protected. So I, 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 I don't see uh, a lot of high-tech manufacturing as a near-term objective. Uh, that's really the achievable. But I, but I think it's important, and I, I say this, I think that there's a new policy, we provided a good ICT policy, that there is an evolutionary path, and we need to kind of understand that and start facilitating, uh, creating the skills, ensuring not just in specialized schools, but all our universities have strong ICT curriculum, they have the infrastructure, the students get exposure, uh, we're creating jobs, I talked about ISP in the um, you know, rural areas or you know, outlying areas of the country that are building the ecosystem. So those people that start building applications, they can start putting local content on the internet, um, they can start servicing the devices, integrating the devices, and then you can move up that and you can start doing R and D in the institutions on some of those things, create new applications and make it leverage on that. So that, that's my my view. Um, I agree with you given the size of our population, it just doesn't make sense. We have a critical mass, but we dominant in West Africa. We should be manufacturing and servicing um, IT for all of West Africa.
available. Uh, so that also means that the rest of the cities is just a folder and it's just a folder. And I mean, the, the issue around policy, guidance, security, about how to, you know, uh, set up that security. For instance, EU now, something called the right to forget. Uh, about last year, June, someone asked for the data kept by Facebook and they came up with 800 pages of data. And, and everything that's ever done, every, every request that you need, everything that we're asking, mm -hmm. is being kept by Facebook. But uh, taking it local, people get them to understand the right, uh, uh, the, the, the responsibility to data. And this is uh, in, in the uh, if we're a threat, can enable the adoption of broadband and internet these days and all of that. Uh, I think the next uh, solution is about uh, uh, all of the innovations you, you mentioned. Uh, one solution is cloud service. Uh, I know if you like TV and the you know, data center uh, and if, uh, if you can collaborate on all the data centers uh, to provide cloud services. Uh, a lot of the adoption in the extent. Uh, one area of cloud services is cloud security, which is a very new concept worldwide. But the way of getting Nigeria uh, apart in terms of security, because we are in security, it's the most global uh, partnership. You know, you make a call, you want to partner, and this is the security of security issue. So, uh, one key fundamental area where cloud benefit the economy is cloud security, apart from software services, infrastructure services, you know, and all of those things. So, so that's my um, observation, and I think um, fitting uh, into your presentation as possible short term solutions rather than long term than 20 years. This is things that can be deployed. Any other
Wednesday month, and then the third is the platform for money sharing information exchange and business networking. The digital draw is a uh, nice uh, project management consulting company, it's a specialized company, specialized in information security, information assurance, giving and project management, and past some of our past speakers at this point are some of the people on the board, and we hope to see you next Wednesday. Thank you very much.